scriptures, you know that the role of music in worship is biblical. And there were many scriptures that I left out of the readings for today. The people of God have sung through the ages. After escaping from the Egyptians and crossing the Red Sea in Exodus 15, Miriam, the prophet, took a timbrel in her hand and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing and Miriam led them in a song, the most ancient of songs. First Chronicles 6 and 16 demonstrate that singing was part of Israel's formal worship in the tabernacle and the temple. The Psalms provided the musical playlist, as we might call it. For ancient Jews, the 150 recorded Psalms offered both Psalms of lament and Psalms of praise, often with the Psalms of lament leading into a Psalm of praise to God. The Psalms offer rich testimony that in joy and sorrow, in praise and lament, the faithful raise their voices in song to God. If you flip to the back of either hymnal, the New Century Hymnal or the United Methodist Hymnal, you will see that most of the Psalms recorded in scripture are set to music. We are to sing our way through the Psalms as we did with the last Psalm in our scripture, Psalm 150. Psalms have the potential to connect us to our ancestors who sang and uttered those prayers of the faith. Hymn singing was practiced by Jesus and his disciples. The song, the hymn we just sang, when in our music God is glorified, one of the verses starts out with, and did not Jesus sing a psalm that night, the night that he was betrayed? The Apostle Paul instructed the people with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. Music is a gift of God from God and part of the created order. From its inception, Job 38 tells us, when the morning stars sang together. I forgot we still have stars in our sanctuary. Imagine the morning stars making a chorus, singing together. And all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. And then at the end in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, we hear these words. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Creation is musical. Human music making participates in the music of creation and reflects the order, beauty, and diversity of God's creation. Singing continues to play a vital role in our spiritual lives as well as our corporate congregational worship. If you still have the red United Methodist hymnal near you, open up to, I don't know, the first pages, Roman numeral VII. It's one of the first couple of pages you'll find. These, this opening page includes John Wesley's directions for singing. First included in the 1761 hymn book for early Methodists. They were not united yet. Well, that's for another story of history. <laughs> Some would say we're still not united. <laughs> that, and when I spell it, it often comes out as untied. So we're just going to stick with Methodist. <laughs> These traditional hymns were brand new as Charles Wesley, author of so many hymns, we, they sound familiar to us, we don't even remember that Charles Wesley wrote them. Uh, 
They were so new that Charles Wesley was still writing hymns. Amazing Grace wasn't even written yet. Usually, only the preacher had a copy of the hymn book with all these new songs. And the preacher or the hymn leader would sing out one line at a time with the congregation singing back what they heard. And in this way, they learned the hymns of the faith. And they weren't singing in church buildings. They were singing outside in fields and cemeteries. The Methodist movement was happening outside church walls. Wesley's direction for singing are meant to offer practical ways we worship together. Wesley believed worship is the work of all the people uniting us as a priesthood of all believers in service to God. And he says to observe these directions. And you can follow along with me. Learn these tunes before you learn any others. Afterwards, learn as many as you please. Oh dear, I'm already in trouble. Sing them exactly as they are printed here without altering or mending them at all. And if you have learned to sing them otherwise, unlearn it as soon as you can. <laughs> well, I say that there are a few reasons for unlearning some of the hymn text, but that also is for another sermon because this service is going to be packed as possible. Three, sing all. In fact, there was a question. This hymn has a lot of verses. Should we sing all the verses? And remembering that I was going to include John Wesley's directions for singing, I said, yes, we are going to sing them all. <laughs> <laughs> See that you join with the congregation as frequently as you can. Good job, congregation. You are here today. <laughs> Let not a slight degree of weakness or weariness hinder you. If it is a cross to you, take it up, and you will find it a blessing. I have often found that, haven't you? Like, I don't know if I want to go to church today, but when we arrive and when we leave, our lives have been blessed. Four, sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, <laughs> but lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, nor more ashamed of its being heard than you were sung the songs of Satan. Five, sing modestly. Do not bawl so as to be heard above or distinct from the rest of the congregation that you may not destroy the harmony, but strive to unite your voices together so as to make one clear, melodious sound. Six, sing in time. And I think from our music director, he might say an amen to that. <laughs> Whatever time is sung, be sure to keep with it. <laughs> Do not run, run before nor stay behind it, but attend close to the leading voices and move therewith as exactly as you can and take care not to sing too slow. This drawling way naturally steals on all who are lazy and it is high time to drive it out from us and sing all our tunes just as quick as we did at first. Seven. Above all, sing spiritually. Have an eye to God in every word you sing. Aim at all, aim at pleasing God more than yourself or any other creature. In order to do this, attend strictly to the sense of what you sing and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound, but offered to God continually so that your singing, so shall your singing be such as the Lord will approve here and reward you when God cometh in the clouds of heaven from John Wesley's Select Hymns, 1761. And Carl Bart points out that singing is not an option. For the people of God, it is one of the essential ministries of the church. Bart writes, the Christian church sings it is not a choral society. Its singing is not a concert, but from inner material necessity it sings. Singing is the highest form of human expression. 
The praise of God, which finds its concrete culmination in the singing of the community, is one of the indispensable forms of the ministry of the church. As we have experienced over and over again through corporate worship and in our individual lives, music can evoke powerful emotions welling up within us. Some music stirs our hearts and sets our feet to dancing or tapping along, while another piece of music moves us to tears. There are people who come to worship sometimes every week, sometimes maybe just a couple times a year. And sometimes people will say, I came to church and I got weepy. I started to cry, especially during the singing. And I just nodded my head. That's what happens to us. There is something that is forming us that reminds us of something in our childhood. Of course, there are those who come just a couple years, um, uh, who come just a couple times a year, and they will say to me, why is it every time I come to church, you sing the same songs? <laughs> and those hymns, too, make us cry or make us laugh or respond with joy. And if you didn't quite catch it, the ones like Silent Night and Christ the Lord is Risen Today. <laughs> Our hymnody is important in shaping our faith, our theology, what we believe, what we beloved. And we tend to remember the theology we sing far more than the theology that is preached. In fact, I know more scripture by singing it than scripture that I have memorized by reciting it. Is that true for you too? Especially if you sing in the choir, and here I'm just preaching to the choir. <laughs> it's also how I memorized the preamble to the Constitution. Thank you, Schoolhouse Rock. <laughs> Through congregational singing, our Christian faith is both expressed and formed. Songs of worship shape our faith. We learn of the nature and the character of God and of the Christian faith through singing it. Our hymnody offers a rich vocabulary of praise, especially strange phrases like, here I raise my Ebenezer, but now you all know what that is about. Simple repetitive music such as praise songs or to say chants are effective, can be effective in moving us to prayer and to praise. And it is also important to have learned some of the great hymns of our faith tradition because they help us to recite the biblical story. They teach us the nature and the mighty acts of God. And they can buoy us up in difficult times when we might bring a hymn to mind and be able to sing most of its words. But if you ever wanted to know the difference between a praise song and a hymn, maybe you know the difference between the praise song and a hymn. Um, I have a great story to offer you. It's called Hymns and Choruses. The cows are in the corn. And so this is how choruses and hymns are defined by this story of the cows are in the corn. An old farmer went in to the city one weekend and attended the big city church. When he came home, his wife asked him how church was. Well, said the farmer, it was good. I liked it. But they did do something different, however. They sang praise choruses instead of hymns. Praise choruses? What are those? Well, they're OK. They're sort of like hymns, only they're different, said the farmer. Well, what's the difference, asked the wife. The farmer said, it's like this. If I say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, 
well, that would be a him. But if I were to say to you, Martha, 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 oh, Martha, 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 <laughs> the cows, the big cows, the brown cows, the black cows, the white cows, the black and white cows, the cows, the cows, the cows, are in the corn, are in the corn, are in the corn, are in the corn, the corn, corn, corn. Then if I were to repeat that whole thing two or three or four times, well, that would be a praise chorus. <laughs> well, it just so happened that on that very same Sunday, a young man from the city church attended the small town church. And when he came home, his wife asked him how it was. Well, said the young man, it was good. I liked it. They did something different, however. They sang hymns instead of regular songs. Hymns, said his wife, what are those? Well, they're OK. They're sort of like regular songs, only different. Well, what's the difference? Well, it's like this. If I were to say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, that would be a regular song. If, on the other hand, I were to say to you, I think I need a long drink of water for this one. <laughs> O oh, Martha, dear Martha, hear thou my cry. Inclinest thine ear to the words of my mouth. Turn thou thy whole wondrous ear by and by to the righteous, imitable, glorious truth. For the way of the animals, who can explain? There in their heads is no shadow of sense. Hearkenest they in God's sun or God's rain, unless from the mild, tempting corn they are fenced. Yea, those cows in glad bovine, rebellious delight, have broke free their shackles, their warm pens eschewed. Then goaded by minions of darkness and night, they all my mild chilliwack, sweet corn, have chewed. <laughs> so look, to that bright shining day by and by, where all foul corruptions of earth are reborn, where no vicious animal makes my soul cry, and I no longer see those foul corn, that, those foul corn. <laughs> I think you've got the ending, don't you? <laughs> and I no longer see those foul cows in the corn. <laughs> and now, Martha, if I were to sing all four verses, or five or six verses, do a key change on the last verse, well now, that would be a hymn. <laughs> we have our preferences, and we can agree on some of those, and we might disagree on others, whether it be traditional hymns, songs of Taze, contemporary praise choruses, classical music. I think we can all agree that Music, especially the music of the faith, is a powerful agent of healing and a beautiful way of offering praise to God. One of the hardest aspects for me, and I believe for many in this congregation, and really throughout the world, was not being able to worship and sing together. In fact, being able to sing together is new in the life of our worship. I don't even think it's been a year, has it, since we've been able to sing together? <sighs> During the pandemic, I lost not any weight, but I lost at least half an octave in my already limited range of notes that I could sing that at least would be pleasing to the ear. I don't think I'm the only one that that is true for. I stopped singing. And when you don't practice, you lose things. But more than that, we lost that sense of social and worship connection with one another. While many of our amazing musicians provided mu beautiful music for us throughout the pandemic, 
that brought us joy, moved us to tears, and many of us were singing along at home, and some of you could sing, hear me singing along and would send me a little chat note, you forgot to mute yourself. <laughs> It could never be a substitute for the spiritual benefits of singing together. Because singing connects us emotionally and spiritually. Singing has been shown to improve our sense of happiness and well-being. Research has found that people feel more, positively, feel more positive after actively singing than they do after passively listening to music or after chatting about positive life effects. 10 years ago in 2013, Time Magazine came out with an article, Singing Changes Your Brain. And the article states, when you sing, musical vibrations move through you, altering your physical and emotional landscape. Group singing is the most exhilarating and transformative of, of all. I don't know, I should ask the choir, what do you think? <laughs> One member of the choir said that explains a lot. <laughs> Science has been trying to explain why it has such a calming yet energizing effect on people. There are physiological benefits of singing. It exercises the brain as well as the body and it's beneficial for improving breathing, posture, and muscle tension. Researchers have found that singing is like an infusion of the perfect twink tranquilizer, the kind that both soothes your nerves and elevates your spirits. The elation may come from endorphins, a hormone released by singing, which is associated with feelings of pleasure. Or it may be from oxytocin, another hormone re released during singing, which has been found to alleviate anxiety and stress. Oxytocin also enhances feelings of trust and bonding, which may explain why other studies have found that singing lessens feelings of depression and loneliness. Pleasure that comes from singing together is our evolutionary reward for coming together cooperatively instead of hiding alone every cave dweller for themselves. The benefits of singing regularly seem to be cumulative. In one study, singers were found to have lower levels of cortisol indicating lower stress. Studies suggest that our heart rates may sync up during group singing. I had heard this before. Singing relieves anxiety and contribute, contributes to quality of life. Group singing can improve physical and mental health as well as promote social bonding. It's a great way to improve our health and well-being regardless of age. I don't think I've done an average age in the choir recently, but you're never too old to sing, amen? And it turns out you don't even have to be a good singer to reap the rewards. Group singing can produce satisfying and therapeutic sensations even when the sound produced is of mediocre quality. Group singing is cheaper than therapy, healthier than drinking, and more fun than working out. It is the one thing in life where feeling better is pretty much guaranteed. Even if you walk into rehearsal exhausted or depressed, at the end, you walk out high as a kite on endorphins and goodwill. This article from Time Magazine. And uh, to your introduction, if you're not already in the choir, your invitation to come and sing. Some of you will tell me, I can't carry a tune, or I was told in elementary choir to just mouth the words. Oh. I tell you that everyone can sing and should sing. Did you hear in this article that you don't even have to be a good singer to reap the rewards? When I served as the pastor at Snoqualmie United Methodist Church, the choir director said, Harley Brumbaugh, he said that he held choir auditions like this. Give me your hand, he would tell a prospective choir member. And then he would do this. <laughs> Is there a pulse? 
Come on, you can join in. Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Does it say sing perfect pitch? Does it even say sing on pitch? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, all ye peoples. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before God's presence with what? With singing. Music expresses a sense of awe and wonder in the presence of God. Our different voices somehow blend together to express the church's unity in the body of Christ in a way few other things do. Singing is a ministry that belongs to all of the people of God, not just the soloists or the choir. Music and singing hold a power that is undeniable when it comes to our mental health. I could say so much more about the positive healing impact that music can make for kids with trauma, adults with trauma, dementia patients, people with Parkinson's, people who are actively in the process of dying when a thanatologist comes into the room to play their harp. I could speak of the correlation between music and math, that learning music improves math skills, because at some level, all music is math. But we would be here all day learning about the benefits of music, and I would literally be preaching to the choir. The Psalms can be part of our playlist to accompany our life. The songs in our hymnals can be part of our playlist. There's secular music that can be part of our playlist because some of the secular music is more sacred some, than some of the hymns of the faith. We can find the connections that we have in our own lives. Cultivating a playlist of music and coming to sing with the congregation on a weekly basis can be a powerful spiritual practice. Like the psalmist in Psalm 40, we can resonate with being drawn from the desolate pit and remember that we are not alone. God is with us. God is with us forever and ever. God is with us. Which leads us where? <laughs> Into our next musical offering from the choir, the anthem, We Are Not Alone, by Pepper Choplin, with soloist A.J. Millerette. 